I'm Dan kurtz and this is the Foreign Affairs Interview. Is there a British identity which is not dependent on grievance? Post-Brexit, can you reconstruct a sense of Britishness which is actually about who they are rather than who they're not? There may be no better example of how domestic dysfunction can hobble global power than Great Britain in recent years. Constant political and economic turmoil has reinforced the sense that this once great power is in terminal decline. Brexit, the UK's decision to leave the European Union in 2016, put Britain as a whole at odds with Scotland and Northern Ireland, where large majorities voted to stay in Europe. In a new piece for Foreign Affairs, the Irish writer Fintan O'Toole warns, a polity that once shaped the world may no longer be able to hold its own shape. Fintan, thank you for being here and for your wonderful essay, Disunited Kingdom, which we've just published this week. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to uh, join you. And I know we've plenty to talk about. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. So b- British politics have been, to put it uh, to put it mildly, something of a spectacle for many of us watching from outside the past few years. I realize the same could be said for many watching U.S. politics as well. But there's been, of course, Brexit to Boris Johnson's antics to the parade of prime ministers in the past several months. But what is so rich in the essay is the way it looks beyond or perhaps um, beneath the spectacle to forces that have much deeper roots and much more significant and longer lasting repercussions. And, And you start the piece in the days after Queen Elizabeth's death in September, noting that, you know, the stability, as you put it, she embodied for so long has been as Shakespeare might have put it, interred with her bones. I'm curious about the significance of that moment and why you decided to start there. It's, it's of course, uh, in part that Queen Elizabeth represented stability in a tie to the kind of imperial past. But you also note that there were kind of other pillars of Britishness that have traditionally held the United Kingdom together. What are those and how have those been weakened over the past several decades, along with the symbol that you begin with in the piece? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, it was a a, a very resonant moment, her death, um, simply because she spanned an extraordinary historical period. Her skill, um, often her skill at saying nothing, but that's sometimes a a very important political skill, and her sheer longevity meant that, in a way, she created an illusion of stability. Um, uh, And of course, that was all the more necessary because of you know, over the course of her reign, Britain ceased to be an empire, went through a kind of identity crisis, seemed to have somewhat solved that crisis by, by joining the European Union. Um, and then it sort of rose again. And, and of course, by the time she died, uh, Britain was again in very, very deep identity crisis about itself, you know, which was represented by Brexit and in a lot of ways exacerbated by Brexit. But I don't think it was, it was caused by Brexit. I think Brexit is as much an expression of this crisis as, as, as it is the cause of it. And the cause of it, if you, if you kind of just stand back and, and look at this a little bit, you know, about, okay, w- what is the United Kingdom? Maybe if you have to call your kingdom United, uh, that sort of tells you something. <laughs> and the United States of America has never seemed all that united either, you know, so uh, there is an element of protesting too much. But the, the, the UK, uh, um, I mean, of course, historically, is an incredibly successful entity if you want to judge it in terms of power and influence around the world. Obviously created one of the one of the greatest empires the world has seen and played a major, major role in shaping world events for, for you know, a couple of centuries. Uh, so you can say, well, you know, it's a very successful entity. What's the problem? And yes, it is a very successful entity, but it's not a natural one, right? So we sometimes assume that nations just kind of, you know, exist because God made them that way. And the history of the UK is is really one of quite slow accumulation of 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 its constituent parts. Right, so you have England, obviously. England violently absorbs Wales, which a lot of the Welsh have never entirely forgiven or forgotten. But in particular, of course, Ireland is always problematic. Has never ceased to be problematic in relation to how it fits into the UK, you know, and obviously we're we're 100 years on now from the independence of the bulk of Ireland, but of course Northern Ireland remains within it. And then Scotland, you know, has this very complicated relationship actually with England. It's a relationship of literal enmity for 
hundreds of years. Um, you know, Scotland is the other for the English, uh, almost as much as the Irish are and the French are. You know, and and that gets sort of buried to a large extent in in the early eighteenth century. Um, by a sort of marriage of convenience, really. Essentially, the English can't go and r- rule the world if the Scots are going to attack them every time they go to war with the French and the Spanish or whatever. Uh, so the English need peace on their own island. And the Scots, there's a very lucrative offer, really, which is you can be part of this empire building process. you know. And, and so these are contractual relationships, in a way, from the point of view of the Scots, you know. Scots never lose their own identity. I mean, if you step off a plane in Glasgow or Edinburgh, I mean, you, you don't think you're in England. You know? <laughs> you, you know very quickly that you're in a different country, different legal system, different religious traditions, educational traditions. You know, a lot of the things that we think of as part of part of nations, I mean, Scotland's always had. So, you know, you created this kind of strange multinational entity which refers to itself as multinational. So, it, it, well, it, there's a lot of confusion. If you, if you listen to English people talking, they talk about the nation. <laughs> and if you listen to uh, anybody else talking, they talk about the four nations. Um, and so it's, a, it, it's an unusual multinational construct. And I try and talk in the piece about you know, what were the great things that held it together and to suggest that each of those things that held it together are are now in very deep trouble and 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 have been really for quite a few decades now. So you, you noted the piece that the economy and economic development was for a long time one source of cohesion or one, one thing that held it together. Brexit is, you know, uh, at least partly to blame for some of the economic decline and dysfunction in the last few years. I believe the UK will be the worst performing large economy in the world, uh, um, at least this year, if not going forward. But you note in a way that I think is surprising to a lot of us that the story is much, much bigger and longer than that. You know, you go back really to the years when Margaret Thatcher was prime minister. I think the usual impression of those years is that she kind of rescued a, a stagnant economy and made it dynamic again. But you quite persuasively show in the piece that she's, you know, set many of these forces in motion. What did she do and how did that contribute to to this long term decline? What What started back in the 1980s? So I'm I'm of an age, unfortunately, where you know I I do remember going to both England and Scotland, you know, in the in the late 1970s, you know, and if you travelled around Britain in those days, whether it was Scotland, Wales, England, I mean, you were really struck by this sort of industrial culture, you know, that's that's what it was. I mean, of course, everybody knows that this is the cradle of the industrial revolution, and the you know there were it was a very strong kind of common working class culture, very proud of itself. Uh, and had been, of course, very, very successful for a very long time, whether that was coal mining or shipbuilding or steelworks or the potteries in the Midlands or, you know, th- th- these were very deep industrial cultures that, that that had very, very profound roots. And Thatcher, I mean, you're right, of course, Thatcher did introduce a whole new dynamism uh, and indeed a new dynamic into Britishness. But if you just take a simple example of it, I mean, one of her great achievements in terms of uh, British nationalism, you know, was the Falklands War, where they, you know, sailed halfway across the world and defeated uh, Argentina. And it was a sort of last gasp of imperial might. And, and it was very, very effective and, 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 and very emotional for British people. And so they're still great and all that. The shipyards that had been used to refit the ships that Thatcher sent all the way to the Falklands Islands were, were all closed within a decade. You know, they were all gone. So so the very culture which had kind of created the base for being able to do this sort of stuff was really destroyed by by Thatcher, you know. And it, it was, politically speaking, very effective because it really sort of got rid of, as Thatcher would have seen it, the enemy within, which was the sort of the, the labor culture, the, the socialist or social democratic culture that was very strong in Britain. It marginalized that and it, it sort of unraveled the sort of cultural and class base of that. But in doing that, you know, whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, you're you're also unraveling one of the really potent areas of commonality that people would have had, whether you were in Cardiff or Glasgow or Birmingham or London or Aberdeen, you would have shared that kind of life. And the marginalization, as I said, of of that way of life, not just 
economically, but also psychologically, you know, the, the pride that went with it. I think the long-term effects of that are actually quite profound. There's another really interesting thread in the piece around the empire and pride around the empire 100 years ago versus shame now, you know, imperial identity, if you were uh, Scott or Welsh, as, as you write, you know, was at a certain time kind of attached you to this great global power. Now it's more often seen as a source of shame because of the even kind of abuses of, of, of British imperialism. And then if you're, you know, Scott or Welsh now, you would like to kind of free yourself of that legacy, which I found a, a, a really interesting force that is kind of reinforcing some of this, uh, these identity changes. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose, Dan, this is a kind of common thing, isn't it, for, I, I hate using the term, but white people, white cultures, you know, is you don't want to feel guilty <laughs> over slavery and over that sort of horrific history of, of oppression, of which, in a sense, you are, you know, part. But and, and so one of the attractions of minority nationalisms is often to say, well, oh, no, that wasn't us, that was them, you know. <laughs> and, and Scotland, for example, was, was over overrepresented in the slave trade you know there's no question that scots were were somehow had clean hands in relation to all of that but it's very attractive in the contemporary context where you can't avoid having to think about the legacy of slavery for example to say well yes that was that was britain you know and and, and that was the british empire but but we're scottish and and scottish nationalism would represent a kind of clean break and a new thing and you know and we're we're multinational. We're... So one of the interesting things actually about these kind of minority nationalisms uh, in, in both Wales and, 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 and in Scotland is that they're not nationalist in the old 19th century sense. I mean, they, they may have a base of ethnic nationalism, but they try to avoid that. Right? They, they try to very much project themselves as kind of multicultural, open, European, all of those kinds of things, you know. And, uh, and I'm not doubting the sincerity of that, but it is also, of course, a way of not having to deal with that legacy of the imperial past. It is a sort of one of those deep attractions of of making the break from Britishness, I think, is that you also cut yourself off from guilt about that that, that legacy. The the struggle with that legacy seemed quite resonant at this particular moment when, you know, at least the United States were approaching, or we're all approaching the 20th anniversary of the Iraq war in, in March. But like a lot of us in the U.S. are thinking quite a bit about how the war affected U.S. global standing and influenced U.S. foreign policy. We probably overlook how often the ways in which it affected American allies who participated in it. In it. Is that, do you see that a legacy in the same way in kind of U.K. foreign policy in these debates in the U.K.? Very much so. Very much so, Dan. You know, the, it's really hard to overstate the extent to which British identity, actually like American identity, was very much tied up with the notion of, of military power and military success. And, and of course, this was very well rooted. You know? um, the Brits won most of their wars for quite a long time. They had a, they had a pretty amazing run. You know, even if we take it into the modern period, you know, the Napoleonic Wars, of I mean, defeating Napoleon was an enormous thing. And, and Britain was the kind of key factor in that. And then you kind of run through, I mean, they defeated Tsarist Russia in the Crimean War. And then, of course, they're on the winning side in, in the two great 20th century conflicts, the, the, the Great War and the Second World War. And the army and the idea of the army and the navy, of course, also as a naval power, you know, these are really potent symbolism symbols of what it means to be British, which is, is why Margaret Thatcher was able to, to make such hay out of them in, in the Falklands War, for example. And one of the consequences of Iraq and Afghanistan is that the British were defeated in both. So in both of those wars, uh, obviously Britain was an enthusiastic participant. Um, Tony Blair you know, made it very clear that he was going to support George W. Bush, whatever Bush wanted to do. And again, we, you, know, you can argue about all the merits of that, but the reality is that it, it became a sort of humiliation. Obviously, neither of them uh, ended well for the United States, but I think particularly for the British, they essentially had to be rescued by the Americans in, 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 in the areas of both Afghanistan and Iraq that they were, they were given to control. And it really marked a point, I think, um, some people might remember these extraordinary images that started to take hold of British soldiers coming back to the air base at, at Wooten Bassett and, and the coffins coming in. And local people deciding that they weren't going to allow the coffins to just sort of 
pass by without without any notice, you know. And and they became they were very touching, but also very melancholy. You know, there was a real sense of saying these are real people, these are our kids who are coming back. And you know, it it, it was not an image of triumph, to put it very mildly. It was an image of loss and and sadness. And you know, you look at it now and there is a pretty much an acceptance that Britain is not capable of mounting any serious military operation on its own. It's not to say it still does not have a, a, an important military capacity. I and mean, if you were Vladimir Zelensky, you know, you'd be saying, well, actually, the Brits have you know, been really important. And, and Britain was very early in the Ukraine uh, invasion to say, we're standing with you and we'll give you whatever you want. And, you know, so, so uh, I, I, I'm not denying at all that it, it's, it, 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 it uh, retains a significant military presence. But as an image of, you know, triumphant Britishness, it's gone, you know. And so it's it's another one of these things that were, you know, really holding the thing together that just doesn't work anymore. This has really come to the surface, I think, for outside observers in the last few years as we've seen this, you know, again, some, somewhat of a spectacle, but the struggle to find a global role for, for, for Britain. There was... I think under Boris Johnson, the kind of much derided global Britain concept. And there's, of course, been a lot of support for for Ukraine in the last year, but that doesn't seem to kind of fully answer the question of what what the UK's global role should be. Do you see any possible resolution to that debate? Do you see a path forward in, in, in crafting something that accurately reflects the state of power now? I think this is the huge question for Britain, isn't it? I mean, having left the European Union, I mean, one of the things for me as an Irish person, and therefore someone who's both kind of very close to it and slightly outside of it, was the extraordinary sense in which in British political discourse, there was so little understanding of how well the British actually did, as it were, projecting their global presence through Europe, you know, so so being in the European Union. Uh, was it was an enormous asset to Britain <laughs> globally, you know? It, it, so it, it wasn't just seen as a sort of medium rank power in its own right, which it was, but it was also seen as uh, as a very influential and important part of the European Union. And just cutting yourself off from that, you know, is in those terms an obvious act of self harm. And we can't ignore the fact that the spectacle, as you um, started out with, Dan, you know, has been has been shocking. Prime Minister after a Prime Minister, sense of, of absolute chaos, an apparent inability for Britain to actually govern itself, an inability to stick with international law. I mean, you know, who would have thought that Britain, which, you know, for good and ill, I mean, had very much placed itself as a sort of central force in the world in terms of democracy, international law, human rights, all those kind of things, would be openly saying that it, it has legislation in front of the British Parliament at the moment to tear up the withdrawal treaty with the European Union, or at least tear up part of it, that it itself agreed, you know, just, just a couple of years ago, you know, that, like this this anarchic presence that it has at the moment, where where ca- can you deal with it? And we're, we're finding that out now at the moment, you know, with the whole controversy about the Northern Ireland Protocol and whether is Britain capable of doing a deal, you know, <laughs> any deal and th- that it could stick to and that you could trust it to do? So getting out of that is going to be, I think, unfortunately, a long process. And and again, this, this I think, also contributes to the, the waning of British prestige, not just internationally, but for people in Britain itself. Early in the essay is you're you're surveying the forces of disintegration or, or or disunity, and some of these are stories that many of us have followed the um, you know Scottish nationalism and the changing demographics in Northern Ireland, along with the way Brexit upset the Good Friday Agreement and the kind of delicate political arrangements there. But you also I think focus on something that was quite, quite surprising to me and quite interesting uh, because it's not what we what we normally see as one of the these forces of disintegration, and that is. That is English nationalism. And you you write that unlike its Scottish, Northern Irish, and Welsh counterparts, Englishness was given no positive expression in political life. Explain this to those of us who are not, you know, kind of focused on that dimension. I think Britishness versus Englishness is not something that we kind of intuitively grasp. And you kind of see these identities changing and evolving. And really the kind of diminishing significance of Britishness is is, is part of what what is changing here. Yeah. So if we just stand back from this a little bit, you know, uh, historically, one of the most potent national identities in the world 
uh, you know, in the very early modern period when those, these ideas of national identity were in a way were being formed, and it was Englishness. You know, the English were <laughs> very belligerent, very assertive about their Englishness, you know, and they formed a functioning central state very early on, you know, uh, so that, you know, they, they, they really had a strong reason to feel that they, that Englishness meant something, you know, the English language developing, you know, all this literature, a sense of national identity becoming very, very strong. And, and this lasts a long time. And, you know, I mean, even when the Scots joined the UK in 1707, there's a lot of English resentments. There's a lot of English people say, we don't want them, you know, <laughs> but, over time, again, the, the deal really being that, you know, the UK is a sort of stepping stone to empire. Right? And so by and large, this is a sweeping generalization, but Englishness gets sort of rolled into, first of all, into Britishness and then into an imperial identity. And what we're seeing now is a sort of unraveling of that in a way, you know, so obviously the imperial one is gone. But also, I think Britishness, what happened really was that in at the end of the 20th century, when Tony Blair had come to power in, in 97, you know, a whole kind of new, modern, forward-looking Britain, you know, and, and a renewal of all that was going on. But Blair and, and of course, Gordon Brown, who, who, who was his um, frenemy and uh, chancellor and, and successor, who was Scottish, of course, um, really th- th- sort of understood, okay, well, Scottish nationalism in particular is a problem. What do we do about it? And what they did was they adopted a, a sort of devolutionary approach, right? So creating the Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Assembly, now called the Welsh Senate, and this also coincided with the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland. So you had a, a devolved assembly in Belfast. So if you think about the four nations, three of them were getting a sort of direct political expression of their own separateness and their own identity. Right? You could vote for whatever political party you wanted in your own country and still be part of the UK. And that was the hope was that this would sort of take the sting out of it. And we can come back to whether it did or not in those countries. But what was left aside was what about England? You know, so so of course England is is by far the largest of the four nations. But there was no real attempt made at all in any kind of progressive way to say, well, actually, the English are entitled to their national identity too. And if it's okay for the Scots to have a parliament and, and still be British, you know, what, what, why can't the English? Or even at some regional level, they're very strong regional identities. But there was really no attempt to deal with, with this at all. You know? And academically, you know, if, if, if you talk to academics who were kind of beginning to work on this idea in the early 20th century of English nationalism, I mean, they were laughed at. They were just, you know, that's, don't be ridiculous. You know, it's it's a stupid fringe of people who wear silly hats and, you know, wave flags of St. George and stuff. It, it really has no meaning at all. But what you see is that very, very strongly in the early part of the 21st century, you get this sort of expression of English identity and English nationalism. And... I'm not at all questioning the validity of that. I mean, as an Irish person, I'm not going to turn around and tell anybody else that they can't have a strong national identity. You know, the problem is that Scottish nationalism or Irish nationalism, Welsh nationalism, there's a whole load of things go with that. You know, your national theatre, your national poets, your, you know, you you have a whole kind of political movements, you have civic movements, you know, none of that exists really in England. It's all folded into Britishness. And English people tend to use British and English as if they mean the same thing. And that gets you only so far because then you're still left with the English problem. And, and what, what comes out of that is Brexit. Right? So the only real chance that England gets to assert itself um, is, is Brexit. That's the thing it's offered. And a majority of English people take it. And remember, Brexit is an English phenomenon. You know, And of course, this is one of the deep reasons why the UK is unstable, you know, is, is, is exactly that. It's overwhelmingly rejected in Scotland. It's about 50-50 in Wales, but within Wales there's a huge division between Welsh-speaking Wales, which is pro-European, and English-speaking Wales, which is anti-European. And, and of course, it's rejected in Northern Ireland. So it's an English phenomenon. And the problem with it is, well, there's lots of problems with it, but w- even from this point of view of English identity, it doesn't solve anything. You know, it's it's a sort of negative statement. It's about saying, well, we're not that. But there's still this very unresolved sense of what is English identity and and where does it go and how does it relate to the, the other national identities and the archipelago? It's still very hard to 
find an articulation of it, but we know it's there. I mean, it's it's a potent force because it produced Brexit, so uh, you, you you can't ignore it. But also, it's quite hard to define and pin down. Scottish independence seems almost like inevitability over the next you know decade or two. But you make clear in the essay that it that it's much more complicated. Now, on the one hand, you have majority of the population of Scotland now favoring Scottish independence and. Of course, there's the the frustration with Brexit and opposition to Brexit within Scotland. But you know, I think the the resignation of Nicola Sturgeon, the the first minister and leader of the Scottish Nationalist Party, uh, last week was you know seen as a move that will set the the independence movement back. And as you note in the piece, Brexit does not exactly make the idea of exiting a union look attractive. So, what do, what do you see happening given these somewhat conflicting pressures within Scotland? Yeah, you know, in my um, Shakespearean quotes, I was I was thinking of that uh, Shakespeare thing about about alcohol, you know, in Macbeth, you know, where it says it uh, it increases desire but decreases performance, you know, <laughs> and this is the paradoxical effect of Brexit, I think, for Scottish nationalism. So, if you go back to twenty fourteen when they had their referendum, where there was a surprisingly high vote, I mean, it was defeated. But I don't think many people at the start of that campaign would have thought that the the vote for independence would have been in the mid forties. You know, it was a, so it kind of changed things. It, it made independence seem like a viable prospect. But one of the big arguments against independence then was, of course, to say, well, okay, go independent, but you're out of the European Union. And do you think the European Union is going to let you back in? Do you think Spain, for example, would be happy to let a country a bit like? Catalonia, you know, leave Spain and then rejoin the European Union? You know, no, no, of course, you know, it's not. So that was a very powerful argument. And I remember being there and talking to a lot of people actually just anecdotally said to me, you know, my heart is in Scottish independence. I really want to vote for it, but I, I just, I can't vote to leave the European Union. It's crazy. Now, Brexit, of course, completely changed that argument the other way around, right? Which is your only chance of getting back into the European Union is, is to leave the UK. And, and there's a lot of sympathy in in the EU, I think, for Scotland, you know, because, I mean, Scots voted very, very strongly to stay in the in the EU and have expressed a very strongly pro-EU identity. And, you know, so there would be a lot of sympathy to let them back in. Problem is, it, it's very, very difficult because you wouldn't then just have an independent Scotland, which would have a border with England, but that border would have to become an EU border. And we in Ireland, and with all the Northern Ireland stuff going on, we know how complicated that is, right? So, so trying to construct a border between this huge European bloc and your nearest neighbour you know, is, is really very difficult. You know, I mean, how, how do you get on with ordinary life? How do you, how do you, you know, dealing with trade, but also just dealing with the norms of the way people move around? And how do you deal with currencies, for example? Scotland couldn't rejoin the European Union without joining the euro, taking the euro as its currency. So they would have the shock of suddenly having different currencies, you know, a couple of miles across the River Tweed. <laughs> you know, none of these things are insurmountable because we do it in Ireland anyway. You know, we, we we have a border, but it's not sort of ideal, and it's 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 you know, it it creates all sorts of questions about the practicalities of doing it. It seems to me the next general election in Britain, which could be really any time in the next two years. I mean, God knows how long Rishi Sunak is going to last. <laughs> the, uh, the precedents are not good at the moment, but I mean, let's assume it's two years' time. That's going to be huge, I think, because uh, not so much for what happens in Scotland, but for what happens in England. If the Conservative Party wins the election, you will have yet again the Scots being told that parties you don't vote for, that have very little support in Scotland, are going to rule you. And they're, you know, it's a conservative party that has kind of gone quite far to the right, you know, has done Brexit, has done, you know, has done a lot of things that you really don't like. And this has been a problem really since Thatcher, but but I think it's it's getting to a point where, again, anecdotally, just talking to people in Scotland, you know, you you get a lot of people who told me, well, I I voted against independence last time, but if there's another conservative government, I I just can't take it anymore. I just, you know, and I know it will be difficult. I know there'll be all sorts of economic and political and fiscal problems, but let's just deal with them and and get out. On the other hand, if Labour is elected, which is what the polls currently suggest, they might have an opportunity to, to get one more go at this, right? which is to do a sort of very radical federalization of the United Kingdom. It kind of says, okay, you've already got devolution, but let's make this even more real, give Scotland a much more power over its, over its own spending, 
um, over its own taxation, um, you know, give, give, let it have a sense of itself as a as a nation, and that it, it can remain a nation while staying in the UK. You know, that 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 will be the offer, I think. And uh, something like Gordon Brown is is very intelligently driving that. Again, I'm not entirely convinced that's going to happen because the history of these things is that once governments are get into power in London, they don't tend to want to give that power away, which is really what uh, federalization would involve. We'll be back after a short break. America's decision to go to war in Iraq in 2003 is arguably the most important foreign policy choice of the entire post-Cold War era. Nearly two decades after the event, it remains central to understanding current international politics and U.S. foreign relations. Brought to you by Oxford University Press, Confronting Saddam Hussein, George W. Bush and the Invasion of Iraq, by eminent historian Melvin P. Leffler, analyzes why the U.S. chose war and who was most responsible for the decision. Based on personal interviews with dozens of top officials and declassified American and British documents, Leffler vividly portrays the emotions and anxieties that shaped the thinking of the president after the shocking events of 9-11. Get your copy wherever books are sold. In Northern Ireland, the pressures cut someone differently. So what differently, uh, you have a growing proportion, though still considerably less than half of the population that would like to leave the United Kingdom and join with the rest of Ireland, which is, of course, a much more economically dynamic and um, you know attractive place than it was uh, a few decades ago. But as, as you note in the piece, this drift is not just a matter of sentiment. In legal fact, Brexit has set in train a process of detaching Northern Ireland from Great Britain. Just, just give us a sense of what exactly has come undone and what that might portend for Northern Ireland. So uh, I won't bore everybody to death with the uh, with the backstop and the protocol and all these terms. But j- j- just just again, let's just stand back from it a sec- for a second, you know, because as you say, it can get complex. But it, it, in one way, it's quite simple, right? Which is that when the Brexit vote went through, uh, the Irish government and the European Union uh, and, and actually most of the political parties in Northern Ireland said there cannot be a return to having a hard border on the island of Ireland, right? For all the reasons we've had all the troubles, we've had a peace process. You know, we, we we're not going back to this because the a border itself is provocative to a lot of people. It reminds them uh, all the time of this existential question of are they Irish or British or what? You know, whereas people most people just want to get on with their lives. But if you if you start kind of implementing this, it it it, it, it has serious consequences. Did the supporter of Brexit fail to anticipate this beforehand? I mean, did they trying to get any of the Brexiteers to talk about the Irish question? At all before 2016, you know, in the in the run up to it, was impossible. They knew they had no answers to it whatsoever, and really they persisted with this, and in some ways still do persist. They still think somebody made up this problem. But there were then really only two things could happen. If there wasn't going to be a hard border on the island of Ireland, you were either going to have to have a very soft Brexit, which would mean that. Britain as a whole stayed in the European Single Market and Customs Union, which would then mean, okay, there's no, there's not a real problem with customs and all that stuff, so you'd be fine. The, the same regime. But of course, that drove the hard Brexiteers crazy. That's not the Brexit they wanted. Right? They wanted something much more radical than that. So if that was ruled out, there was only one thing left, right? which was that you basically have to have some kind of effectively a border between Northern Ireland and Britain. Right? So Britain's outside the European Union. And Northern Ireland has to stay in the European Union for trade purposes. So Northern Ireland is still in the single market and it's still in the customs union. And you can get into all sorts of minor detail about this stuff, but if you stand back, that's a pretty big thing, right? So the biggest single thing Britain has done politically in the last 50 years is leaving the European Union. And one part of the UK has a very, very different experience of that. It's, It's not the same Brexit. It's a much softer, much more uh, open kind of uh, relationship with the European Union in which it's sort of half in and half out. Now, in principle, that's extraordinary. I mean, it's it's like saying, you know, Alabama can have its own trade relations with Mexico. (laughs) And it doesn't really matter what the detail of that is so much as as it is a statement. This part of the UK, which is supposed to be like every other part, is not the same. Right. And of course, you already have a situation under the Belfast Agreement where at any time, so Britain accepts quite rightly that a majority of people in Northern Ireland can vote at any time to leave. Right, It's their right. It's a legitimate aspiration. 
And if there is a referendum, they can vote to leave and Britain will facilitate this. Now. So, so in a way, it's already been psychologically semi-detached. Um, and, and Brexit has added to that, I think. I mean, w- without getting uh, too deep into the incredibly complex you know, legal and, and trade details here, is an arrangement that satisfies all parties in Northern Ireland and in and within the rest of uh, the rest of Britain even even possible? I think Rishi Sunak traveled to Belfast last Friday to try to reach an agreement on trade rules, but this has been a kind of you know unresolved piece of of leaving the EU that has tormented every prime minister. There's some speculation that they'll want to get something done before the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement in, in April, but it still seems like they're quite far from from a truly um, you know satisfactory arrangement for all parties. Yeah. So the the thing to say about this is that there's no undoing the huge mistake that unionism made. So in some senses, if I tried to think of myself, if I were a unionist in Northern Ireland, there is no arrangement that would make me happy, right? Because unionism for me would mean having exactly the same conditions as somebody in England does, same relationships with the European Union as somebody in England does, and that ship has sailed. If that's what you wanted, you, you shouldn't have done Brexit. You shouldn't have supported Brexit, you know? And remember, the unionists in Northern Ireland, because they held the balance of power in the Westminster Parliament in that sort of critical period, they brought down Theresa May, who was probably their best friend, because May was the one who was saying, well, actually, let's have an arrangement in which the conditions in Northern Ireland are exactly the same as the rest of the UK. And that means that we have to have a very soft kind of Brexit. Effectively, you know, this was the so-called backstop arrangement, right? They brought down May. They went for a very hard line kind of Brexit which actually exacerbated their problem because it meant that actually the, the the gulf between Northern Ireland and Britain was going to be even greater <laughs> in effect. So can you come up with a solution that undoes that? Well, no, you, you just can't, right? The only way you can do that is by tearing up the withdrawal agreement, starting a trade war with, with the European Union, you know, creating more and more chaos. And Rishi Sunak may be weak, but he's not mad, you know? I mean, he does realize the desperate need to kind of stabilize Britain and that it just can't afford these continuing conflicts with the European Union. So Sunak definitely wants a deal. The majority of people in Northern Ireland are quite happy with a deal, right? So businesses in Northern Ireland, by the way, have have always been very happy with the protocol because they get the best of both worlds. They get to have kind of free trade with Britain and free trade with the European Union. Why wouldn't you like that? You know, the, the, the problem has been with implementation. So this is a complex arrangement and it was, it was, people might remember, it was kind of a last minute arrangement, right? So it was cobbled together very late to get a deal done and to save Boris Johnson's skin. That didn't last for very long, but at the time it helped him win, a, win an election. I got Brexit done. I got this, this fantastic deal, which he sold. And how it would work was not very well known. And the European Union is a very, very legalistic organization, right? That's, it's just a set of laws. I mean, that's what it has to be. It's a, you know, and so it implemented this in, a, in sometimes just kind of crazy ways. Nobody really cares if a lot of sausages is going from England to a supermarket in Belfast. I mean, who gives a damn? Like, you know, the, the problem, the issue would be if goods were going into Northern Ireland, then into the Republic of Ireland, which means they're in the European Union, and then they can be exported to France or Germany or Italy right, or whatever without any further checks. So you have to have some separation of what's staying in Northern Ireland and what's not. And this is perfectly doable. I mean, you know, it's this is... I mean, bureaucrats love this stuff. You know, it's a, it's a sort of catnip for, for you know, trade nerds. It, you know, and, and the technology, of course, is perfectly capable of, of doing this. And that's what the solution is. And everybody knows this and everybody pretty much agrees it. The, the question is politically, right? And so it's a political question which really takes us back to this kind of British identity crisis. Because Brexit seems like a kind of solution to the British identity crisis, right? It was kind of saying... It's all their fault. Everything that's wrong in Britain is really tied up with the fact that we're in the European Union and we're being oppressed by Brussels. And of course, it's not, you know, I've used the line before, but if you you overthrow imaginary oppression, you get imaginary freedom. It doesn't actually do anything. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't help you with your real real crisis. But the whole question about whether they'll agree to finally solve this last bit of the Northern Ireland question is, can they give up the grievance against Europe? To be quite frank, most of them have never been to Northern Ireland. Most of them don't care about Northern Ireland. Their sense of of connection to it is very, very weak. But it's the last thing that allows them to sort of keep going with with this sense of grievance. And it sort of raises this question is, you know, 
Is there a British identity which is not dependent on grievance? You know, <laughs> Post-Brexit, can you reconstruct a sense of Britishness, which is actually about who they are rather than who they're not? And I think the solution or otherwise to the Northern Ireland Protocol problem will tell us a lot. I think Sunak has moved on and has decided we can't keep going with this stuff. We just can't, you know, keep trying to project ourselves as being a sort of poor, weak, oppressed country who's being, you know, badly done down by the European Union. We have to get on with things. But there's still a, a very significant part of the Conservative Party that just can't let go of this thing because it has become their identity. You know, there's a sense of victimhood and oppression that, that they've created for themselves, purely created for themselves, you know, uh, that, that really has become who they are. And, and so moving on from that, I think, is, is going to be difficult. You last year published an uh, outstanding and much much acclaimed and uh, um, much lauded book called We Don't Know Ourselves, which is really about the kind of transformation of Ireland in your lifetime, kind of weaving together your own personal story with the, the transformation of the country. We could spend another hour talking about uh, the fascinating history of Ireland over this period. But do, do you see um, any resonance or, or lessons in that for the kind of ch uh, potential change in in British identity, and are there kind of parallels there that might be um, useful in showing where things could go in, in in Britain? If we in Ireland have acquired any wisdom, it's only by doing everything wrong first, you know. <laughs> and so uh, I have no sense of superiority about any of this. I mean, I I think one of the reasons I've been able to write about Brexit for you know for a few years is that I, I mean I do understand nationalism. I know how it works because you know I grew up in it with it. You know, it's it's been the dominant. Um, cultural psychological force in 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 Ireland. You know what we've kind of very very painfully got towards is an understanding that national identity. First, you can't ignore it. You know, you know, people are saying, "Oh, I don't like nationalism," and I'm like, "Well, that's fine," but you know, it exists and it's it's a powerful force. So you, if you ignore it, it it doesn't go away, which is what's happened with English nationalism. You know, it's had this kind of very profound uh, consequence. So what do you do with it? You know, and, and what you need to do with it is to actually to have a sense of its multiplicity, you know, and have a sense of, of, of how do you construct a national identity, which is open and inclusive and to which people can voluntarily belong, maybe for quite different reasons, and for which can be hyphenated. This is to do with um, with migration as well, you know, and, and and a lot of people coming into Ireland. But it's also to do with, say, solving the Northern Ireland problem. It's 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 not solvable un unless we have a real sense of pluralism. So plural identities, you know, are are really to me the only way forward. And I think Ireland has kind of painfully got to that point. And one of the things we learned is that you know Irish nationalism was always based around what it wasn't. You know, we weren't English, which was true, <laughs> but it only gets you so far. You know, you, you're ultimately left to think, well, who are we? You know. And that question, I think, it's not being answered to me in the UK at the moment. There is no really credible or powerful narrative about what Britishness might mean in a positive sense uh, now. In the, you know, that doesn't involve going back to nostalgia about what it used to be, and doesn't involve saying who we're not. You know, the, the anti-European thing. Um, you know, what 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 does it mean? And if those who want to see the UK continue can't articulate that powerfully, and not just in abstract terms, but of course it has to be real. I mean, it's about people's lives. You know, what, what makes people's lives better if they're British? <laughs> if you can't answer that question, um, then I don't think it's an entity that's going to survive in the long term. We could, of course, spend hours talking about this in the context of the United States and, and American nationalist identity as well, but we will save that for another time. Uh, Fintan, thank you for the, the wonderful essay in our current issue. And thanks for doing this today. A pleasure, Lynn. Thank you for listening. You can find the articles that we discussed on today's show at foreignaffairs.com. The Foreign Affairs interview is produced by Kate Brannan, Julia Fleming Dresser, and Molly McEnany. Special thanks also to Grace Finlayson, Caitlin Joseph, Nora Revenaugh, Asher Ross, Gabrielle Sierra, and Marcus Zacharia. Our theme music was written and performed by Robin Hilton. Make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you like what you heard, please take a minute to rate and review it. We release a new show every other Thursday. Thanks again for tuning in. 